Olympics, Krishna Chaitanya Das. This meeting is being live streamed. By staying in this meeting, you can assent to being live streamed. Anyone with access to the live stream can watch or share with others. Okay, got it. Let me see here. Wait. Okay. All right. Good morning and welcome. Today is uh, June 9th, 2023. And uh, we're here to discuss <coughs> this book, the Sri Sri Prapanajivanamritam, Life Nectar of the Surrendered Soul. But uh, before we get started, any questions or comments from anybody? Let me turn up the sound here. There we go. Sometimes I feel odd <clears throat> lecturing. I can do it. I've done it. You know, I've been a teacher for more than 30 years. Trying to think, since 1991, officially working as a teacher, but I started giving talks on the Bhagavad Gita in um, 1976. That's almost 50 years ago. So I'm not convinced, as, as a point of pedagogy, I'm not convinced that lecturing is the best way of transmitting information or helping people to understand something necessarily. I tend to tip the balance more towards dialogue. I, I think dialogue is very helpful. Um, in the early days of my search for truth, we would go to the temple room early in the morning and listen to a lecture. Sometimes the lecture would be uh, two hours, sometimes four hours. And that tested my patience and attention span. Um, I think maybe my generation has a longer attention span. Now everything is reduced to five seconds on Tick tack, tick tock, tick tock, you know, reels and Instagram reels that only last three seconds, five seconds. Even when I was a child, television commercials were one minute or two minutes to make an argument about a product. Now everything is reduced to a millisecond. So then again, I'm not so sure that listening to somebody lecture for a long period of time is necessarily helpful. It may be an exercise in intellectual entertainment. But uh, the purpose of this talk is not, of course, intellectual entertainment, but we're trying to get at the meaning of these different uh, scriptures that we're looking at. Prapanajivanamrita was written somewhere in the last hundred years by Srila Sridhar Maharaj. I don't, I don't know when the first edition of this book came out. It might have been the 50s, 1960s, something like that. But Anyways, here we are in the rejection of the unfavorable, as this is called. And this is particularly powerful verse that I have to keep coming back to. It's, it's hard to simply fast forward through 
this book because what's being said here is very deep with meaning. Try to find the verse here. But we came upon this verse by Srila Rupa Goswami from his Nectar of Instruction, or Upadha Shamrita. Give me a moment here. Can't seem to find the verse number. Well, this is the Bhaktivachanamrita, or the where Bhilashri Ramas is giving us the words of nectar from the devotees, Patikulya Vivarjanam. Uh, and so he he starts out his argument quoting from Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, where he says, Nadanam Najanam Nasundarim Kavitam Vajagadisha Kamaye, Baba Janmani Janma Janmanishware, Baba Tad Bhaktira Hai Tuki Twai. Uh, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu himself says, I have no desire for wealth or worldly promotion. No, nor do I desire wife, family, and society, nor do I aspire for Vedic religiosity or mundane scholarship. The only aspiration in my heart is that in every birth I may have un, unmotivated devotion for you. So whatever is unfavorable, for devotion should be given up. They asked me, what, what should we call this talk this morning? Now, here it is. They said, what should, well, what should we call the talk this morning? I said, uh, let's call it letting go. Because letting go of negative things is another way to make your life positive. Sometimes we're attached to different things. So we think these things are helpful for us, but in the end, they're not really. Um, our goal is bhakti or divine love. So you can think about what is negative for what's thought to be love in this life, and you'll see that it corresponds very closely with what Rupa Goswami says in this next verse. We're looking at the 10th verse here in uh, rejection of the unfavorable. Bhakti Bhadaka Doshas Tyajya. So, Srila Sri says, uh, you should let go of these doshas, these defects or faults. Uh, Atyahara prayasas cha, prajalpo niyamagraha, chana sangas chalulyam cha, shadbir bhaktir vinashiti. And to comment on this, Srila Sri simply quotes what Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur says, as if he doesn't want to comment any further, invent something that his, his Guru Dev has already commented on. But this verse is really worth study and it's worth looking into. So that brings up the question, why are we doing this? Okay, I said, well, I like a bit of dialogue because it's dynamic. It shows that you're thinking, I'm thinking. This is not some dry intellectual exercise, but we're trying to reflect on our lives. Uh, the great Greek philosopher Socrates, he said the unexamined life is not really worth living. 
It's it's like animal life. Animals don't think, why am I here? What is the purpose of life? Um, what is dharma? It's not a question for cats and dogs, uh, but human beings, uh, we're busy thinking about these questions. Why am I here? How can I improve my life? Is there a life after this one? And that's why we read scriptures. Otherwise, <clears throat> so many people will say, well, you won't find the answers to life in some book. Well, Really, whatever you can say has already been said. So when somebody tells you, oh, my philosophy of life is there is no truth, you have to ask them, well, is that an original thought? Did you invent that? Or did you hear that from someone who heard that from someone? And you can trace that line of thought back to a particular philosopher who dedicated a lot of his time to thinking about meaning and meaninglessness and decided that, well, life has no meaning. Is that your own original thought? Or are you simply living an unexamined life and clinging to the idea that life is meaningless as, as a way to help you live an animal life? Is it really an original thought? So why read scripture? We read scripture because uh, scripture should give you some insight into how to live your life properly. Now, there are those who read scripture because it's about the law. And you figure, well, in human life, I need some code, some law to live by. And here's an old book, and the old book tells me what the law is. But this is superficial. You need to go deeper. The unexamined life is not worth living. This, of course, is not an original thought even of Socrates, because going back to the Vedas and the Vedanta, we find a tato brahma jigyasa. Uh, now you have, a tato means now. And so that word has been analyzed. What does it mean now? It means now that you have this human form of life and you can think about things. Pramajigyasa. It's time to inquire into the nature of spiritual reality. What is that reality? Who am I? Uh, where does all this come from? So, Apart from the fact that you can ask yourself that question, uh, you'll find that, as Srila Sridharmarsh pointed out, there's gradation everywhere. You're not alone. There are those who are more advanced than you are on the path, even in your inner circle. And if you look around, there are also great geniuses of spiritual discovery, uh, maybe beyond your inner circle. And if you look through history, you'll find these geniuses include uh, Buddha, Muhammad, Jesus Christ, um, great spiritual prophets who understood the nature of God on a deeper level, and they wrote about it. And the wonderful thing about reading is that it permits you to enter into the mind of great thinkers and great prophets and go deeper into your own reality. So that's why we read scripture. We read scripture because it's interesting what my neighbor says across the street about the barking dogs and uh, fireworks on Sunday. But it may be more interesting to probe the teachings of Jesus Christ or Buddha or Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu or Srila Rupa Goswami and see, do those teachings have anything that can help me? 
so I have my own ideas about uh, God consciousness. I have my own ideas about death and what lies beyond. But I should be able to find in the scripture um, a deeper understanding. Now, in this particular case, today we're talking about love, we're talking about divine love, and we're talking about those things which hinder love. And I said before, the name of our talk is Letting Go, and I'm going to try not to ramble too much. But Srila Rupa Goswami gives us a hint as to the things that may destroy love. So, surrender to God, then, involves giving up what hinders us on the path, uh, letting go of negative activities and feelings, and even leaving behind toxic people who destroy our sanity. Now, it's not easy to let go. It's very difficult. We become addicted to bad habits and negative behavior, thinking that these things make us happy. We hold on to anger and hate and other negative emotions, thinking that that's who I am. These things define me. When in reality, they keep us from understanding the truth. They keep us from true enlightenment and Krishna consciousness. Um, sometimes I wonder why people get involved in abusive relationships. And they find themselves unable to walk away from those relationships. I myself have been involved in uh, abusive and toxic relationships. And sometimes it's very difficult to just say, all right, I'm going to let go of this person. I'm going to draw a line here and set some limits. And I think part of that is because we have this sort of conceit that our life is like a movie, and in that movie, I'm the star. Well, in order for a movie to be interesting, for a film to be interesting, it, it needs some conflict. Uh, there's the main character and the nemesis. So sometimes in your life, you have people who act as your nemesis, and if you remove them from your life or from your metaphoric movie, suddenly the movie's not interesting anymore. Uh, there's no more conflict. Uh, people get divorced, and then they find, what happened to the drama? What happened to the conflict? Where's that person I was always arguing with? And when that person comes back into your life, it, you're happy because here's somebody who understands the whole movie from beginning to end. They know your childhood. They know your school. They know your dramas in life. They know your achievements. Of course, at every step of the way, they were opposing you. They were putting you down and destroying your accomplishments or backbiting. But at least there's somebody in your life who knows all those things and shared that with you. And um, sometimes to eliminate such a person, you feel almost as if you're eliminating your own history. And I think that's why it's difficult to let go of toxic people in your life. Uh, but it's important to let go of these sort of negative things. So Sri Rupa Goswami, getting back to the verse, I don't want to go too far away from that. He identifies certain things as destroying uh, devotion. So he says, Atyahara prayasas cha prajalbo niyamagraha chana sangas chalolyam cha shadbir bhakti vinashiti. The first thing on his list, and there's six, is Atyahara. And this is commented on in different ways. It generally means uh, over collecting, but it can also mean overeating. Um, 
you could say acquisitiveness. So trying to give up acquisitiveness is very difficult because in our modern life, everything is all about getting money and spending money. We're constantly involved in a materialist uh, hunt for more and more, and we're never satisfied. Uh, our drive to get money and spend it as fast as we can is really at the core of our modern life. We're encouraged to monetize everything, even our uh, private life. Now we have uh, social media. In the old days, I used to like Instagram because I, I could see photo, photos of the other devotees doing things in different temples around the world. And I got a kick out of that. I thought that was great. Here's Rajasundari in Israel. Here's uh, Marie Ugoric in Rapid City, Iowa. But little by little, uh, this sort of mentality of capitalism and materialism, it creeps into even something as simple as sharing your photos with your friends because people are encouraged to become uh, influencers and have followers. So the more followers you get who love your photos and now short little videos, you can become an influencer. And if you become an influencer, you can get money and be famous. So it appears that the goal of life, according to our modern institutions, is to get money and be famous. And that is what represents happiness. And uh, if you try to work outside that system, you're considered mad. Um, and the hippies, in the 60s, the hippies tried to revolt against the monetization of every word, deed, and breath. But they failed miserably. Everybody makes fun of the hippies. Uh, but really, is that a healthy way to live? Uh, is extreme capitalism and extreme materialism a healthy way to live? Well, Rupa Goswami says no. And more and more, if you think about it, uh, you can understand this is not a healthy way to live. Uh, I live in a small town in Mexico where uh, in the old days, it, it was very quiet. And artists and writers came here to think and study. And uh, people loved it because it was quiet. So suddenly began attracting tourism. And now thousands and millions of people come here to see how quiet it is. And now it's basically been destroyed by commercialism and tourism. And that's not just San Miguel de Allende. It's everywhere around the world. Um, is this a good paradigm to live by? When I was in Los Angeles once, I visited uh, off the freeway in Los Angeles. They have these stores called outlets where they sell uh, clothes and things cheaper than normal. And uh, there's one section where there's these huge big box stores, uh, football fields and football fields of them right off the freeway. When you park your car and walk towards the front of the building, they have these huge glass doors. When they open, a blast of cold air comes out of the building because outside it's a hundred degree heat or 40 degree heat and inside it's cool as a refrigerator. So each one of those buildings has hundreds of air conditioners and there's thousands of those buildings next to the freeway where millions of cars are burning millions of gallons of uh, gas every day. Is this really the best system for living? Isn't it possible to live a bit more simply? Well, this is an example of atyahara, 
collecting too much, being driven by this uh, materialistic desire. So we hear people say the one who dies with the most toys wins. Uh, or as Word, Wordsworth put it, he said, the world is too much with us late and soon getting sp and spending. We lay waste our powers. So is that the paradigm we want to live by? On the other hand, Rupa Goswami here is, is telling you that is destructive of love. This whole tendency towards uh, getting and accumulating, it, it, it tends towards uh, being miserly, towards hoarding. This kind of obsession is negative. It, it goes against bhakti. Srila Prabhupada comments on this verse. He says that the basic principle for a spiritual society is stated in the first mantra of the Sri Isha Upanishad. So the Isha Upanishad says, Isha Vashyam idam sarvam yakkinja jagatyam jagat tena tyak tena bunjitaha ma gridakashya svidhanam. Everything animate or inanimate that is within the universe is controlled and owned by the Lord. One should therefore accept only those things necessary for oneself which are set aside as one's quota, and not accept other things, knowing well to whom they belong. Yeah. This is a very nice verse in the Ishopanishad. Uh, there's a story that illustrates this idea of Atyahara that was told to me by Srila Sridhar Maharaj. Uh, so once upon a time, there was a, a wealthy merchant and, uh, in Bengal. He lived on an, kind of an island in the Ganges there. And it began raining one day. And it rained so hard that the island began to flood. And people could understand soon it would be underwater. So the merchant hired a boatman to take his treasure across the Ganges. And he carried trunks full of gold coins and precious gems and uh, began filling the boat to the point where the boat was riding very low in the water. And he got on board the boat as it was pouring rain and the current of the Ganges was becoming more virulent and the water began to rise. And then people seeing the boat fleeing the island began running and jumping into the boat. And, and, and it was riding even lower in the water. And so the boatman began to cross the Ganges, which was very wide at that point. So wide that it's very difficult to get to the other side. I, I once swam across the Ganges at, at the uh, Garunga Setu Bridge. And, uh, Navadweep. And the funny thing was, uh, when you get about a quarter of the way out, it looks like you're halfway through. So then you work as hard as you can, you swim as fast as you can to finish and get to the other side. And now when you're completely exhausted, you're only about halfway across and the current is really powerful. So the, bigo the boat was stuck in the storm and uh, the water rising and the merchants thinking about his gold. And now the boatman notices a hole in the boat and the boat's beginning to sink. So the, uh, the boatman says, we have to try to swim for it. This boat is not going to make it. We're going down. And the merchant says, what? He grabs a bag of gold and he puts a bag. He understood, now I can't save my trunks of gold. They're going to sink, but at least I can rescue a couple of bags of gold. 
and he fills his pockets with as many gold coins as he can as the ship goes down. And the boatman says, leave the gold, you fool. Uh, you're going to drown. And he jumps into the water as the ship just capsizes. But the merchant can't listen. He can't let, let go of his bags of gold. And suddenly he's in the water and the bags weigh him down. He finds himself on the bottom of the of the river. Finally, he lets go of the bags of gold, but with all the gold in his pockets, he's too heavy to swim to the surface, so he drowns. So the point is, you have to learn to let go. Apparently, this drive for collection is a good thing. Uh, you're supposed to be driven. You're supposed to have a goal and, and work hard and push and push and the ends justifies the means, and it doesn't matter how many people you hurt or how many people you destroy as long as you get the gold. This is not the purport of spiritual life. Then we wonder, well, how, how will we live then? If, if we follow the instruction of Srila Rupa Goswami here, who says, Atyahara prayasascha, give it up. What will become of me? Uh, there's a nice quote from the Bible uh, in Matthew uh, chapter 6. This is found in the teachings of Christ, where they're asking Christ, well, if we follow you, what will become of us? Uh, how can we leave aside our ordinary lives and trust God? How can we have faith? Uh, don't we need to work hard for living? And Christ says, I say unto you, be not anxious for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than food and the body more than raiment? Behold, the birds of heaven, that they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, and your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are not ye of much more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add one cubit unto the measure of his life? And why are ye anxious concerning raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. Yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God doth so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Be not therefore anxious, thinking, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Be not therefore anxious for the morrow, for the morrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Now, this idea of atyahara, or collecting, it doesn't only refer to naked materialism. Um, Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur writes in his commentary on this shloka by Rupa Goswami that this applies also to the tendency to acquire knowledge on the part of mental speculators or philosophers. The Bhagavatam points out the endeavor, to, the endeavor of philosophical speculators to write volumes of books on dry philosophy devoid of Krishna consciousness. This is an example of Atyahara. So, for example, at this juncture of time, I'm not wasting my breath trying to justify 
the existence of God. Does God exist or doesn't he exist? That argument has already been made. Um, in the end, we quoted Pascal saying, uh, faith has reasons that reason cannot know. We've, or we should have uh, reached by now, the understanding that faith is above reason. So I'm not here to, to say, oh, isn't it interesting? So-and-so has a YouTube video where he questions the existence of God. Uh, what are his arguments? To, to be able to know that and understand it and refute it belongs to a class of uh, knowledge that one tends to overaccumulate or collect. And uh, at some point, even Bhaktivinoda Thakur and his Sharanagati, he says, all this knowledge, uh, the weight of so many books on my shoulders, uh, it's a burden. It's like the burden carried by an ass. And it's time to give up that burden. So once one arrives at faith, one can let go of so many volumes of, of books uh, on theology, on uh, intellectual development. I'm guilty of over-collecting in that sense, but I feel justified in that the service was given to me by Srila Sridhar Maharaj and by Govinda Maharaj and by Goswami Maharaj to do my best to defend uh, these arguments in print. And for that reason, I have a lot of books. But I understand this is another form of atyahara. So uh, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati comments, those who have no desire for Krishna consciousness and are simply interested in possessing more and more material things, either in the shape of scientific knowledge or monetary gain, are all included uh, under the control of atyahara. So this idea, this idea of collecting, accumulating, being materialistic, it's destructive of love. And you can look at that teaching of Rupa Goswami and say, I don't know, is that useful for me? Does that help me to know that? Am I guilty of collecting too much? Am I surrounded by people who are obsessed with collecting too much? Maybe it's time to let go. So we study the scriptures because the scriptures should give us some insight into proper living. And if you think this is a good insight from Srila Rupa Goswami, avoid over-collecting because it destroys love. It ultimately destroys divine love. Then take that, take that to heart, and you can consider that as part of the nectar that's being spoken of here in the Prapana Jivanamritam. The next thing that Srila Rupa Goswami mentions is what he calls prajalpo. Prajalpa means unnecessary talking. Bhaktivinoda Thakur says this generally tends to mean um, unnecessarily useless idle talk that's meant to insult others. <laughs> so there's a, there's a test given by uh, Socrates. It's called his triple filter test, where uh, someone once came to the philosopher and they said, oh, I have something fascinating to tell you. Uh, you've got to hear this. And Socrates said, well, wait a minute. Um, let me just ask you, is this true? Do you know it to be true as a fact? And his friend said, well, it's pretty juicy. It's pretty juicy gossip, uh, but is it true? I'm not so sure about that. Then uh, Socrates said, well, okay, uh, is it good? Is it beneficial for the person uh, you're gossiping about? Will it help them? Will it help me? 
And his friend said, well, no, not really. And then he said, is it useful? And the, the man shook his head. And then Socrates said, well, I don't want to hear that. And again, in the West, we're fascinated with Socrates because he seems to be the first big philosopher in Greek. But this also goes back to the Manusmriti. In the Manusmriti, there's a really beautiful shloka that Srila Sri Ramar used to like. Satyam bruyat priyam bruyat na bruyat satyam a priyam bruyam cha nanritam bruyat esha dharma sanatana manu. He says, speak the truth. Speak pleasantly. Do not speak the truth in an unpleasant manner. Even if it's pleasant, do not speak untruth. This is Sanatan Dharma, Esha Dharma Sanatana. This is the eternal uh, religion. So, when Srila Rupa Goswami speaks about Prajalpo, he's saying avoid this kind of unnecessary talk. It doesn't help anyone, it's not beneficial to anyone. Now we hear so much about. Uh, fake news. Uh, sometimes I see devotees get involved in uh, conspiracy theories. They're not really sure if the conspiracy theory is true, but it seems to them that uh, so many falsehoods are being generated in Kali Yuga, and they want to speak against falsehood. But Srila Goswami is saying, be very careful. Uh, Prabhupada comments, when we speak with a few friends, we immediately begin unnecessary talking, sounding just like croaking toads. If we must talk, we should talk about the Krishna consciousness movement. So in your speech, be careful. Don't spend your time... Um, speaking ill of other devotees, of uh, sincere truth seekers who are doing their best. Um, those outside the Krishna consciousness movement are interested in social media and debate about useless socio-political schemes. Don't waste your time with social political uh, schemes, conspiracy theories, all these things and other frivolous activities are included in the Prajapo category. Intelligent persons interested in Krishna consciousness should not take part in such activities. Now, the next thing that he mentions in this list, these are six different things. I'll go back to the verse, so I don't seem like I'm just rambling around here. Atyahara prayasas cha prajalpo niyamagraha jana sangas chalolyam cha shadbir bhakti vinashiti. These six things destroy love. Collecting too much. Uh, oh, big projects, prayas. It means big projects. Uh, avoid burnout, prayas. Over endeavoring for mundane things that are very difficult to obtain. You'll find, even if it's in Krishna consciousness, even if you're trying your best to uh, build a temple or print a book or something, you can find that by putting so much energy into something, uh, it destroys love. You become obsessed. So av avoid obsession. But the next big one is niyamagraha. And this is an interesting expression because in Sanskrit, uh, when two different words are put together, you join the vowel. So niyama agraha. Agraha means uh, to ne neglect. But when you put the two words together, uh, the agraha becomes agraha. So agraha means eagerness to accept, and agraha means failure to accept. Uh, we're talking about niyama. Niyama means the rules and regulations, shastra. 
They're meant for spiritual development. So how can that be a bad thing? Well, sometimes we become so obsessed with uh, scriptural rules and regulations that we see that as key to our spiritual advancement. But it's much easier to criticize others and see, oh, well, you're not following. Uh, I went to a meeting once in uh, Ireland, and one devotee saw that another devotee wasn't wearing neck beads and said, well, Prabhu, you should really wear your neck beads. Uh, and all right, that's true, but uh, physician heal thyself. We need to uh, remove the beam from our own eye before we uh, try to criticize someone else for having a splinter in their eye. Um, Prabhupada comments, Niyamagraha has a twofold meaning understood according to the particular combination of words. Those interested in Krishna consciousness should not be eager to accept rules and regulations for economic advancement, yet they should very faithfully accept scriptural rules and regulations for the advancement of Krishna consciousness. This is also true for our Indian friends, because in India, they have a much deeper acquaintance with the Shastra, but many people see uh, scripture as key for economic development, and they want to follow uh, the aspect of Shastra that promotes uh, artha, wealth, leaving aside the ideas about bhakti. So Srila Sridhar also, he pointed out, Western devotees, we like pomp and circumstance. We like the, uh, the outer aspect of the thing. We like the superficial uh, trappings of Krishna consciousness, uh, beautiful saris, um, tea drinking, all these things that are fun. And they're happy parts of the Krishna conscious community, but not necessarily essential towards developing love. And then there's Jana Sangha. And Jana Sangha means toxic association, especially uh, materialistic persons. So avoid the association of materialistic persons, especially uh, those who blaspheme devotees or those who are interested only in material happiness. Um, apyaharis, those who desire the perfection of mystic yoga. And finally, there's lolyam or greed. And that gets back to Atyahara. So letting go of these six faults, that was our theme for this morning. And uh, Srila Prabhupada ends his commentary on this shloka by Rupa Goswami. He says, when human society gives up these elementary faults, all enmity will cease between men and animals, capitalists and communists, and so forth. In addition, all problems of economic or political maladjustment and instability will be solved. This pure consciousness is awakened by the proper spiritual education and practice offered scientifically by the Krishna consciousness movement. This Krishna consciousness movement offers a spiritual community that can bring about a peaceful condition in the world. Every intelligent man and woman should purify his consciousness and rid himself or herself of the above-mentioned six hindrances to devotional service by taking wholehearted shelter of this Krishna consciousness movement. So once again, atyahara prayasas cha, give up, let go, too much collecting, too, much, too many big projects, prajalpo niyamagraha, Unnecessary, useless gossip, niyamagraha, superficial understanding of, of the scriptures, uh, janasanga, bad association, and uh, greed, ultimately. So 
Of course, Atyahara and Lolyam are two sides of the same question. One is the attitude of greed, the attitude of wanting more and never being satisfied. And the other one is the conduct of taking and taking and taking, collecting and collecting. Both these things should be uh, left aside. Now, I am not a perfect example of any of that. You can look behind me and see this man collects too many books. Yeah, a thousand books are not too many, but one is enough. Yeah. Why are we reading this? What is the point of reading this? We have the Bhagavad Gita. Why read the Prapanajivanamrita? There's the Bhagavad Gita. You know, what? That's a great question. You know, why read this? Anyways, I'm done quoting quotes and giving pithy remarks. That's a good one. A thousand books are too many. Or not too many. But one of you. But anyways, look at my library. This is not my entire library. I don't use I don't use those so much now. I have this thing called a, an e-reader. And this is a Kobo. When I recommend this, you know, you can put all the Shastras on there. I've got 3,000 books on there and I'm rotating them in and out all the time. But again, this was my service. It was given to me by Srila Sridhar Maharaj. It was given to me by Goswami Maharaj. It was given to me by Srila Govinda Maharaj. I had to edit a number of books. And editing is very difficult work because uh, just the other day, I was, uh, I I'm working on a, a book by a high-level devotee, and he, in his talk, quoted some American general. And he said, well, it was the General Patterson who said blah, blah, blah. But I know, well, it, uh, not correct. It wouldn't be Patterson. It would have to be Patton. But then I looked it up, and it's not Patton. It's Eisenhower. Okay, now who needs to know that? Who cares, right? I care. <laughs> That's why I do this. At some point, I was editing Srila Sridharaj, and he would say, Hegel says the absolute truth is by, by himself and for himself. And in those days, we didn't have the internet. There was no Google. There was no AI. I had to go to the library at the University of San Jose, University of California, San Jose, San Jose State University. And uh, I had to go through a stack of books to find where Hegel says reality is by itself and for itself. And I couldn't find it. Why? Well, because Hegel wrote in German. So according to the particular German translator of Hegel's specific Hegelian philosophical language, they had a particular take on that. And I realized that that expression probably came out of um, a particular professor who taught at President's College uh, in Calcutta in the 1890s or the 1910s, whenever Srila Sridharmars was studying there. And uh, so, I am a particularly obsessed person. Uh, I have my own anartas and bad qualities. One of them is uh, over collecting books and ideas. And I try to use that in Christmas service because that, that was a service given to me. I don't recommend that you follow that path because it's extremely dangerous. All these books are like poison. There's different, uh, a botanist or a, a pharmacist in his pharmacy has all different kinds of poison, arsenic, strychnine, uh, cyanide, uh, neem, 
neem oil. My wife has a lemon tree and it has these little mites on the lemon tree. And I found that I can treat that using neem oil, but neem oil can be toxic. So a pharmacist has to know what is the use of all these different toxins. I, I quote Pascal. Okay, don't read Pascal, he's toxic. <laughs> I like what he says about faith. It's a beautiful thing. It inspires me. Dostoevsky. I love Dostoevsky because when I was a child, I had child epilepsy. And my father said, you're an idiot. Idiot. You're an idiot. And I thought, oh, God, I'm an idiot. And uh, so one Christmas, my mother, either to rub it in or to help me, I'm not really sure. She gave me a book by Dostoevsky called The Idiot. And I thought, well, I'm an idiot. I'll read this. And I found profound consolation. I got great help from Dostoevsky because he's someone who struggled with his faith all his life. He's a brilliant, brilliant writer who struggled with his faith, much deeper than any uh, American writer. Uh, American writers are always about macho and the code, like Hemingway. Code, be a man. You know, but Dostoevsky wasn't worried about being a man. He knew he was a man. He was interested in God. He sat in front of a portrait of Christ called the Yellow Christ in a portrait gallery in Austria. And uh, the, the Christ is horizontal. It's, it's just, the canvas is only that high and it's very long. And it shows Christ laid out after death. And so Dostoevsky was looking at that and he's thinking, so was Christ dead? Did he die? Is that it? There's death? Or is it, as Srila Sridharma said, die to live? So Dostoevsky promotes this idea of die to live. He's interested in resurrection. He's interested in how faith can resurrect uh, a, a decaying soul, like Raskolnikov in Crime and Punishment, or uh, Ivan in uh, Brothers Kalamatsov. How can it resurrect an atheist? He's interested in all these questions. So Dostoevsky is fascinating. But Dostoevsky is also an, uh, uh, an obsessed gambler. He's a gambler addict. I forget how these a gambler holic. He's also an alcoholic. And, and so this man is not up to the level of a Srila Prabhupada, a Srila Govinda Maharaj, a Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakwa, a Srila Sridhar Maharaj, uh, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. But if you're living in the West and we're surrounded by rank materialism, Someone like Dostoevsky can give you light. So when I was a young man, I, I read The Idiot, and I thought, well, if being an idiot means like being Prince Mishkin, uh, who's a saintly person, then that's okay with me. I don't mind being an idiot if being an idiot has something to do with being a saintly person. I like that. It's, it's a very unreal conceit. I don't really think of myself as a saintly person. Not anymore. I did when I was in my 20s. I thought, I'm doing it. Hare Krishna, man. Yeah. I'm really a saintly person. But not now. I'm, I'm too old. I, I'm, as Srila Bhakti Siddhanta used to say, I'm, uh, I'm honeycombed with faults. This is too many, too many sinful activities. I'm like a guitar being eaten by termites, you know. But I have my books. Anyways, now I am ranting. I, I, I thought, finish the lecture, take some questions. Kirti, Kirti Daditi is here, as always. Thank you for joining us, Kirti Dadi. And Lilavati, thank you for being here. And Donna Kay, Abhiram, G.A. Ramananda. Ramananda, he's here. Huh. 
Madhusudan Das. The killer of the Madhu demon. So in, in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna is always, no, Arjuna is always calling Krishna Madhusudana. Oh, Madhusudana, slay this. You are the killer of the Madhu demon. Slay this demon of doubt within me. So that's the purport of Madhusudana. Slay the demon of doubt. Give me faith. Anyways, thank you all. I, I don't know. I'm trying to say something useful and practical. I don't know if it is. Uh, I hope so. Yeah. I hope uh, this is not simply intellectual entertainment. You can put this on while you're... But if it is, so be it. You can put this on while you're cooking, while you're cleaning your house, while you're washing your car. And... Uh, as always, our message is uh, commercial free. We don't ask we don't ask you for any money. We don't ask you for any donations. The only thing we ask you for is the most valuable thing that you could possibly give, and that's your time and attention. And uh, my job here is to try to keep this book in print, and hope that people will continue. Uh, reading the Prapana Chibinamrita and getting some light from it. And uh, hey, my original intent was to fast forward through the book and uh, kind of give a summary and finish it as quickly as possible. But I find myself uh, tasting the nectar or the medicine. And uh, maybe that's medicine for my soul as well. So all of you pray for me, pray for my soul, that I can understand the message of three Rapanajibanamrita. And so I will pray for the souls of of you all and keep you in my thoughts and prayers. Marie Ugoric, Leela Sundari Devi Dasi, Anandashesh Prabhu, Hare Krishna, Nirupama, Didi, Sri Krishna Chaitanya. Scarlet Bloom. I hope to be able to finish this book, but nobody wants to say hello or goodbye. Okay. I finished. I finished school yesterday, so I'm feeling good. I have high. I have less pressure, you know. Because when you're teaching, you have to assume the persona of the teacher, whatever that might be. And you have to keep it going every day, every day, every day, you know, for six months or four months or however long it is, you know. And now finally I can take off my teacher hat and be who I really am. Mahayogi. <laughs> Anyways, to our friends out there and Facebook land, YouTube land, Instagram land, and all those different lokas. It's interesting because in the uh, Bhagavatam, you know, there's different planetary systems mentioned as loka, you know. But the word lok, it means planet, but it's also like a circle of influence. The parliament uh, in India is called the Lok Sabha. It means the assembled people. Lok, it also means people. So there's the people of, you know, Andhra Pradesh and the people of Madhya Pradesh and the people of, you know, Uttar Pradesh, UP, people of Bengal. These are different lokas, just like the Satyalok, Brahmalok, Janalok, Tapalok, Mahalok. So you can think of those as being like spheres of influence, like the world of sports, the world of business, the world of finance, the world of politics. They're worlds, but where are they physically located? See? So we have Instagram loc, YouTube loc, and Zoom loc. So we're on Zoom loc, which in Spanish means loco, or 
to where Zoom logos. Anyways, adios, Hare Krishna, Gora Bhakti Vrinda Ki Jai. We'll see you all next week, we hope. And bye-bye. Uh, this is Maha Yogi saying adios. And jai, Maha Yogi Prabhu Ki Jai. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, see you next week. Большое спасибо. Увидимся на следующей неделе. Please accept our dandavats. Пожалуйста, примите наши dandavats, our obeisances, наши поклоны. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Marie, for your help. Hare Krishna. Nirupama, I love you. <laughs> Nirupama, I love you. Bye-bye.